Welcome back. I hope you had a good break. And I would like to now introduce our third keynote speaker, Dr. Melvin Tan Chan. Melvin is the Assistant Dean for Knowledge Management and Education, Research Scientist at NIE. His research work focuses on examining teaching and learning practices and their impact on student outcomes using quantitative methods. Melvin's most recent research examined student educational transitions from secondary to post-secondary, and it would be these findings that he will share in today's presentation. Without further ado, Melvin, please. Okay, um, thanks, Trina, for the introduction. Um, the topic today is about future learning skills, um, school work and life and where we are right now and where to next. One of the questions that, that I'm thinking about when thinking about future, uh, future readiness is about what does it actually mean? Uh, taking a quote from Mark Pratinsky, uh, he's one of the uh, leading gurus in uh, future-oriented education, and he asked one question, and he, or rather he, he gave the definition of what future-oriented education is. And it's about dealing with the real things that our kids need in uh, their future lives. So, but this also begs the question, like, what does future readiness really mean? And as educators, haven't we all been uh, in, in, working in school and helping students develop their competencies uh, to be ready for the future? And uh, if students really need a set of skills to navigate the future world uh, that they would enter into when they leave school, what might these skills be? Uh, who are those that are better, who might be better equipped with these skills or, or competencies? And what are the factors or the ways in which educators and society in general uh, could actually help students mature and be equipped with these skills? Now, I think it's, it's interesting to also look at the skill composition in the 21st century context. I think the first speaker spoke a little bit about that, and I think Marcus also alluded a bit to what happens in application in the classroom. But if you look at the broader context of society and, and the broader changes that technology, innovative technology brings about, what it's actually replacing is that it, it makes uh, less important routine and non-routine manual work um, and, and also uh, routine connective work. So we're talking about like general accounting, uh, even programming, research, and even imaging, uh, for example, taking an x-ray in the hospital. Uh, these are things that can for example, could be outsourced or could be done uh, by techno innovative technologies. And what we actually see is an increase in demand for non-routine, interactive, and analytical work. And what this emphasizes uh, work or, or other tasks or skills that is about expert thinking, about mental connection, problem solving, and actually for teachers in terms of uh, the facilitation or during instruction. So as educators, we all can be happy that we all have a jobs because uh, these are uh, complex presentation and complication, uh, non-routine interactive work that are important in the 21st century context. Now, there are also concerns in the literature and also in, in popular media about whether there's uh, uh, concerns about education and career mismatch. Um, uh, I think the local newspapers has, has at, from, point, from time to time reported about this. And topics on this has, has also gotten quite a significant interest uh, among uh, in, in the general society. So one of the a recent paper that by a group of researchers looked at PR data and PR uh, data sets represents uh, the adult version of PISA OECD. So what they found was that there tends to be lower when the, when there is evidence of a career education mismatch, there tends to be lower workplace or workforce productivity, and even among uh, workers with higher qualifications. So what this points then to is that um, higher, qual higher qualifications may not necessarily cushion workers from structural or economic disruptions and uncertainty. What are the skills that matter? When we look in the literature, we, uh, there, there's often a, a focus on, or at least a, a discussion in the shift in the demand for skills. And the demand of skills, as we alluded earlier, is focuses on analytical skills and that are non-routine. 
Um, there's also an emphasis on the importance of non-cognitive skills, because these are skills that not only prepares students for the world of work, but it allows them to look at the four points which, I, which you can see on screen to detect fake news, to gain trust in, in, in the authorities in the system, uh, to, to make sense of information that comes from multiple sources and to be critical about those sources of information. So the five, five main domains of skills that have been talked about would be problem solving, learning, communication, um, personal, and as well as social. Social means to engage others, to work within teams, to, to, work, to, to resolve conflicts, and so on and so forth. Now, there are in the last, the, 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 or rather the topic about framing future readiness is not new. Uh, it's been an extent of people, or, or, or these education researchers and, and scientists in general has started to work on or rather to frame what are the core competencies that students actually need as they progress through schooling and out of schooling into the workforce. So one of the premier frameworks that actually come out uh, is the PISA framework or more specifically the VCCO uh, project that looks at three dominant uh, competencies that students need. There is also the ATCS21 uh, that came out from the University of, a group of scholars from the University of Melbourne. Uh, and they do also focus on uh, nurturing in terms of these thinking, flexible problem solving skills, collaboration, and communication skills. Now, in Singapore, we do have, and most recently, we, uh, there is also the 21st Century Framework and the CCE 2021. So what we see, in, and when I summarize it on the left, the left hand side in terms of the table, we see three broad domains of identity, relationships, and choices. And within these broad domains, there are five aspects of competencies or skills, if you will, uh, that, that focuses on students' social awareness, the self-management, uh, the relationship management, responsible decision-making, and in the middle or centered within those competencies is self-awareness. Today, I, I'd like to at least propose a particular framework. Some of you might actually know about this framework or have been involved in projects uh, that were in framework or in terms of the reading. Uh, this is a framework of positive youth development. So what it does, or at least what this framework subscribes to is that it focuses on individual resources. Uh, there are intrapersonal skills, disposition, beliefs, and also facilitate, facilitating uh, psycho, psychosocial conditions that can help or at least support individuals to thrive, to engage, and to achieve success in various aspects of life. Um, and this movement is also the part of the, the positive psychology that focuses on promoting adolescent development. And in this framework, there are five broad domains again, uh, that focus on competence, various aspects of competence, the social, cognitive, and academic. Um, it focuses on confidence, connection with your social context, with parents, schools, teachers, community, the peers. Uh, there's also an aspect of character. Uh, and lastly, there's an aspect of caring, making sense, being able to show empathy, uh, to see things from another person's perspective. So in, in our study, what we did, we, we tried to frame uh, the positive view of the PYD uh, across the constructs or, or the skills or the survey instruments um, that we've collected of students. So under competence, we have measures of academic self-concept, conduct flexibility. Under uh, confidence, we've got psychological capital, connection, we've got the various relations with peers, families, and teachers. And of course, under caring, with, we have uh, ability or to, to understand another person's point of view, we, we also have a number of what we call a maladaptive uh, constructs. One of them, we look at career indecision, where students express difficulty in making choices and decisions uh, about what they want in the future in terms of the career. Uh, we have a construct uh, we should call suboptimal identity, uh, where it represents an, an identity formation that's incoherent. Uh, there's a repetitive thinking of uh, negative thoughts. And the, I think there's one more on the intolerance of uncertainty, people who, who do not, who fears the unknown. 
how does this map out with all of the uh, SG21CC? So we tried to make some alignment or at least some relevance to the local context. This is what this these are ways in which the constructs of PYD and the constructs that we that we measured in the study um, maybe map on to the five broad constructs of the 21st CC. So, for instance, the the, the spec of competence can be mapped onto, uh, or at least alluded to, uh, responsible decision making and um, character and caring with this aspect of social awareness. Now it goes back to the first slide that we showed um, that asked this question, if students need a set of skills uh, to, to navigate into a different world that they enter when they complete their education, or at least they move into higher education, what, what might this be? We've answered this question, or at least I've showed you uh, uh, some of the dominant, dominant frameworks. Now the, the, the rest of the presentation, I'd like to take you through two other questions that are of interest to, to me. Uh, one is like, how might these skills, who might be better equipped for the skills? Like who might these students be? Uh, and the second would be, how might they be nurtured? What types of, what factors uh, or what schooling experiences, uh, dispositions uh, may actually have to explain differences in uh, uh, different endorsements of future readiness. Now, just a quick introduction of this study. Um, this, the aim of this study is to provide rich insights into the education, career, and life choices of young people. Uh, in this study, we follow, uh, or rather we, we study a large cohort of youth starting from um, secondary three. Uh, and in last year, we, we, we resurveyed them uh, when they're 18, about 18 plus years old. Uh, um, uh, and across across a range of uh, or, the, or rather a range across different post-secondary institu institutions. Um, in under the sample, you can there are a bit more description about these the the other aspects of the cohort that that we actually captured. But today, um, this presentation will focus on um, the the data set that combines the second and third wave, meaning those who are in second secondary three. When they're 15 years old, uh, and when we resample them or resurvey them uh, in 2020-21, and when they're about 18 plus years old, sample size is about almost 1,400, which is pretty, uh, quite a good large sample size that we have. Uh, this is a, the, the sample characteristics. You see the breakdown, uh, at least in terms of the social demography of the students, uh, gender, race, uh, and school type. Uh, about 34% JC, 42% poly, IT, and others. Now, one so how we how I started out is to understand positive uh, uh, future readiness. Um, as I as I was showing earlier, one how we understand future readiness is through the construct of positive youth development that's represented across ten different constructs, uh, and that each of these ten each of these constructs are framed within a, a broader domain. Um, and, and when we look at, and what we wanted to do was to see if there are profiles or there are samples uh, that can be derived from the data that represents uh, different aspects of positive youth development or what we call future readiness. So one of which that we came up was what we call high positive youth development. And about 58% of the population or the students we sampled subscribe to this um, uh, characteristic. Now, the next group that we found was what we call low PYDs. And you can see it's quite distinct. Uh, this group uh, we provided low ratings across a number of positive traits, but correspondingly high ratings on negative traits like career indecision, varying uncertainty, and suboptimal identity. Now, the next question, or rather a series of questions like to ask is then what characterizes these characteristics? Um, just a bit of a preamble on, on that, that might guide you uh, in terms of interpreting the results. So I'm going to interpret them in terms of whether the statistical significant or not, and in terms of the effect size that looks at the magnitude uh, of, the, of, of the relationships. So one of the th first thing we look at would be student background characteristics. Um, and then there's the streaming effects, and then there's also uh, perceptions of a social class and social status. So in general, what this slide shows is that in terms of student background characteristics, there isn't much that's happening. 
a majority of the effects are between small to moderate. And you can see to uh, from the bottom of the slide, um, there's not much of an influence of, of uh, students' academic achievement on the distinction or at least an endorsement of high and low PYD. So next question you ask is whether these profiles actually matter. I'll just, I'm just going to skip the specifics in the middle uh, table and just focus on uh, what is important. So we look at certain outcomes, the life purpose, the mental well-being, uh, career prospects, and what we found was very large and very significant differences, meaning that students with higher, P, higher PYD uh, were more likely to endorse or more likely to report higher life purpose. They were more likely to report more positive well-being and were more confident of their career prospects. And what we also found was that these students were lower in terms of their depression and anxiety. We look at then uh, what explains differences in the profiles in terms of schooling experiences. Schooling experiences matter. When we ask students uh, both in secondary three uh, and, uh, and in post-secondary, um, whether they felt that the school prepared them for, for post-secondary school and for life after graduation, this had, a, this had an influence on future readiness. Um, career activities, those who had intentional or maybe poor, what we call proactive engagements with careers uh, were more likely to be more, better uh, future ready. And then there are also a bunch of uh, pro-social, educational, and contextual relationships that we looked at. Uh, one topic that came up, or at least one construct that came up was post-secondary cause regret. Uh, students who were more uh, future ready say that they they were really happy in in the cost in the cost or at least in the institution they're in, and they will not likely want to change anything. We've... Next, we look at the secondary school uh, data, secondary data in terms of the types of practices that they are, they have been exposed to in secondary school. Um, so one of the things we so the first this this slide looks at the learning dispositions we look uh, and we found quite substantial influence in terms of students' dispositions of inventiveness, the mastery goal orientation, and how they feel about school, uh, how engaged they are in the classroom. Um, and interestingly, academic anxiety and fear of failure uh, has small to negligible influence. Uh, next, we look at the instructional climate in the school. Um, generally smaller influences, but what we see, what's, what you see on the top is a stronger influence on inquiry-based instruction, or at least classroom climate. Now, summary. Um, Pre-visual readings of post-secondary students were assessed on PYD outcomes. Um, and what we found was two distinct profiles of high and low. Um, the high profile uh, students were more likely to attain positive post-school outcomes. For example, the clarity of life purpose and the mental well-being. Um, and by contrast, low students, students reported low positive youth development and high uh, negative uh, indicators were what we call, were, were deemed to be less release future ready because they reported lower outcomes and experienced higher anxiety and depression. And what's interesting also is that the profile of 42% that uh, plays in uh, the low profile group warrants some attention. It's not, it's not a small proportion by any account. We found that the characteristics of future readiness composed of people who are uh, students who are generally males and those with higher perceptions of the social class status. Uh, we found generally modest influence of conventional important characteristics like race, power attainment, and socioeconomic status. Uh, we found that Future ready learners tend to engage more in, in proactive career engagement, as we see in a number of activities. Um, they express more positive post-school, ex uh, post-secondary school experience, less regret of choices. And interestingly, they, these group of students also reported that they were physically active. Uh, how we measured this was in terms of uh, exercising more than 30 minutes uh, a week. Past educational experiences in terms of school, it was generally modest, but as I mentioned, it highlights the value of inquiry based over conventional instruction, like exam preparation, so on and so forth. Um, student learning, there was more substantial influence. Um, and 
the last point was this uh, schooling experiences experiences matter implications um, the modest in instruction in fact signal the need for more targeted programs outside the classroom now we know that there are programs as sync programs um, that may actually exist that may, may not be captured in the study uh, but I think what we might want to think about is, is there a way for us to actually monitor the effectiveness uh, of these programs and how it leads on to uh, future readings? So that's one question. Uh, we found that proactive career engagement is important for future readiness and certain activities actually benefit from better facilitation. So for instance, um, we found that almost 40% of, of students said that they have never engage person, other people to talk about um, their, their career interests, nor have they identified uh, potential employers. And, and know that these are 18 plus, 18 year old students. Uh, and, and additionally, when you talk about ECG school counselors, 60% uh, of them have said that they've never talked to the counselors in their school. And one thing about the highlight so is that uh, the findings on the substantial negative influence of cost regret and future readiness why do students regret? Uh, in our study, we found that a quarter of all post-secondary students surveyed uh, expressed some form of uh, cost regret. Like you ask them if they like to change the course, and a, a quarter of them said that most likely and very likely they would, they, they would like to do so. And we found that these uh, inclinations were associated with a number of uh, less desirable characteristics. And pardon my... Um, uh, self-promotion. Uh, this is something that came out yesterday and you can see that the two authors are present in this room. It's like also the point you to uh, uh, insert that I got from the article about the importance of friendships, uh, social networks, and essentially a whole community approach, um, and that how the importance of school in facilitating um, the formation of such bonds. Thank you very much. And I'd like to acknowledge my team um, in this slide. And if you have time, please visit our project website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melvin. Um, I've, and for reminding us that there are actually different profiles of um, teenagers with positive uh, youth development, uh, I guess, trajectories. And while um, education does matter, it does, mat it does matter in very different ways. And that's uh, probably worth some ex further exploration.